welcome to another brand new episode of T Watches a Scary Movie. My name is T, and of course, we're talking scary movies. I appreciate everybody tuning in for another brand new episode. Remember, new episodes go up every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Those are for the video-only episodes on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. Again, youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. Audio version goes up on Podbean and Spotify, typically about an hour or two beforehand. So if you're looking for just the audio version, you can go to one of those platforms to pick that up there. And then, of course, make sure to check us out on our other channels. we got a Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash T Scary Movie. Again, that's facebook.com slash group slash T Scary Movie. That's where you can see things like written reviews, conversations that myself and other people in the group are having. Uh, this week, we had a fun conversation about a good pick three from a really, really good list of horror movies and sequels there that's been going on. But you can see other fun stuff going on in there, too. And you can find out about our watch parties because we always do a watch party every Wednesday after the show as well, too. We got a fun one coming for you tonight. You got to go to the Facebook group to see what it is. Uh, and then beyond that, you can catch me on my social media. You can find me on Twitter under Axdew, A-X-D-E-W, or at Instagram under Theron underscore Reynolds. So follow me at those channels and make sure to reach out as well, too. I love talking to folks, especially about anything horror. So uh, reach out. Let's get some discourse going. So what are we talking about today? So initially, I was going to be reviewing the film The Orphan, uh, the 2009 thriller uh, about the uh, little girl who is not what she seems as she's getting adopted by a family. And I was going to be reviewing the prequel, Orphan First Kill, which is in production that initially was rumored to be re be releasing this past weekend. Of course, that did not happen. The movie is actually still into production right now. Um, so apparently it was never going to be released this past weekend. So there was no chance of that working out or happening. I bet we'll probably be seeing that this fall. So I had to pivot. And I decided because uh, later this month, I wanted to take another look at The Strangers Pray at Night, the sequel to the 2008 hit The Strangers, starring Liv Tyler and Scott Speedman. I realized that maybe I should take a look at the first Strangers again now, too. I haven't watched it in such a long time. Um, I was not honestly the biggest fan of it my wife and i got to see it opening night in theaters and was quite let down by it to be quite honest and i've only watched it once or twice since then so i figured you know what it's been at least a decade at this point let's go ahead and check it out again so tonight that is what we are talking folks i'm going to be talking the 2008 hit the strangers and the secret 2009 hit orphan that's what we have coming up for you here on t watches a scary movie now don't forget in addition to what we're talking about here tonight in our watch party, we do have our TV watch party making its return here after uh, after a little bit over a month here now going on tomorrow. So if you're watching this live, if you're watching this new here, this is on Wednesday, February 2nd, tomorrow, February 3rd, which is a Thursday, we're going to have our TV watch party. We got a lot of fun stuff coming up in there for y'all to check out. Get to the Facebook group if you want to see what's going on and joining us. Join us in the Discord so you can watch along with us, folks. And with that, um, yeah, a couple of things to talk about there. We got our Texas Chainsaw Massacre trailer. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is coming up here in just a couple of weeks, uh, two to three weeks here on February 18th, I believe, on Netflix. And we got our first uh, first big release trailer showing what Leatherface and a Sally Hardestry have been getting up to for the last 40, 50 years at this point. It looks fun. It looks insane. Uh, we don't really know much of a story here besides looks like these characters are coming to, you know, coming to Texas basically to revitalize the town. And somehow that makes them run afoul of Leatherface, who is still there right now. So we're going to hopefully learn a little bit more about that as we get closer and closer to the release date. But it's been interesting seeing a lot of the discourse about Texas Chainsaw Massacre online since the trailer hit. And even before that, because folks have now started coming through like they always do all the details of all the other films to pick out stuff they don't like and the stuff they really did like and the biggest thing folks cannot like seem to wrap their heads around is alex uh, alexandria daddario's age in texas chainsaw 3d because if you recall 
Texas Chainsaw 3 is supposed to be a direct sequel, kind of like this new film is. It's supposed to be a direct sequel to the original film. And basically, it's explaining that after the end of the first movie, pretty much right after uh, Sally got like got away and was picked up in the pickup truck and drove off screaming, Leatherface is waving around the chainsaw and everything, that she understood, understandably, went and told the cops everything that was going on. The cops showed up to take away uh, Jedediah uh, 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 Sawyer, you know, Leatherface there. There was a big shootout with a mob in the town. And you, you've seen the movie. If not, go check it out. I do, in fact, like Texas Chainsaw 3D. I think there's a lot to enjoy about it. But the problem is, is that if you look at the timeline, um, we're still supposed to be set back in the 70s. And then uh, Texas Chainsaw is supposed to actually be taking place in modern day when it actually came out, which is 2013. Now, the thing is that they retconned a lot of that to where now uh, the original events of Texas Chainsaw Massacre weren't supposed to happen until 1979 as opposed to the early 70s from when it was initially set, which means that if my math is correct, uh, Daddario's character would only have to be like 32, 33 in that film, which does kind of match up with her. So I think folks are complaining just because they want something to complain about and because nobody likes the idea of a 60, 70 year old leather face running around killing people. But y'all... If you came to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for nuance, if you came here looking for some deep meaning and understanding and things like that, I don't know what series you've been watching. Over the last 40, 50 years at this point there, we can definitively say that none of these movies connect cohesively to one another, okay? No matter how much of them we like there, like the original film and then the second film with the Breakfast Club poster and everything, even that has some retconning going on in there. Uh, Leatherface, check Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. That doesn't make sense with uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and it retcons some stuff with the first film as well. Then there's the next generation, the Matthew McConaughey one. That doesn't make any sense when you compare it to the other films or anything. Then we got our remake, the Jessica Biel 2003 one, um, the Michael Bay produced one there, which complete reboots, so we don't have to worry. Then they make a prequel that even retcons some things out of the Jessica Biel one. Then we got Texas Chainsaw 3D, which again, gets rid of all those sequels and is a direct connection to the original film. But then we get Leatherface, another uh, the second film called Leatherface, which was a prequel to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So this film has never been worried about continuity or about anything making that much sense there. This is not the series for that at all. Like even Friday the 13th has more, like more strict rules in it than Texas Chainsaw Massacre does. And that's not a knock against it. That's kind of the fun is that you know you're going in here to see some outlandish chainsaw kills and that's all you're really looking for. So I think folks looking at the new trailer, like, yeah, you can be worried about it. Yeah, you can be scared that it's going to turn out to not be so good. But that's kind of the way that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies work out. There are definitely more films in that series that we would say are on the bad side that don't turn out to actually be that good than there are on the good side. They're all still fun for sure. But we don't look at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series to be like this fantastic award winning series or anything like that. So guys, stop being so pretentious. The film comes out in a few weeks. We don't know that much about it. It's probably going to be just as fun as all the other ones there. Uh, and again, we, you know, we can all have fun hating on Next Generation, even though that is such a really, really fun movie. It's trash, but it's a fun movie to watch there. So that's all I have to say about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Take a breath, y'all. Take a breath. We don't know anything yet. So, that leaves us to our main event here, talking about The Strangers and Orphan. And I'm going to go ahead and get things kicked off here with The Strangers. So, like I said earlier, um, I saw this film opening day. Uh, at the time, I believe I was working for DirecTV. And I remember seeing all the trailers coming out for The Strangers and thinking, man, this looks absolutely fantastic like i love 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 home invasion movies um like i think those ones are honestly as scary as it can like as they can come um and i think that when you go for the actual uh, like the actual horror element of that it, that, that makes it even scarier because there's plenty of home invasion movies that aren't really like horror movies or anything um, but when you focus that around actual horror, you can do a lot with that. So it makes you think of movies like, you know, when a stranger calls or black Christmas or the collector or even don't breathe or other films around that time, like, uh, the purge even, you know, like there's a lot of film with that whole home invasion premise behind it. 
And the Strangers uh, chose to have a more muted, more low-key story and not doing anything too outlandish like The Purge to where, you know, we're in alternate America and one night a year, you know, you can do whatever you want. Crime is legal. Most people are only committing murder at that point there. You know, it's nothing like that. Instead, this is a more muted, realistic kind of story to where a couple who's clearly uh, in the midst of some issues there um, are staying at what would basically be an Airbnb these days, but they're staying at a, uh, at, at a vacation home after leaving a wedding reception and they're trying to find a way to reconnect and everything. And they find themselves besieged or besieged by three strangers who now are looking to attack them for whatever reason that is. And that's, uh, that's the story to the strangers there. Okay. A couple ends up, uh, at a vacation home and they are terrorized by three strangers who aren't looking to let them leave. Scott Speedman and Liv Tyler are our leads in this film. And, you know, it's a very, very small cast. Like, there's pretty much nobody else in the cast. Glenn Howerton from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Dennis Reynolds pops up for a little bit in the film. But beyond that, it's really just our two leads and then our villains in the film. Now, having just our two leads in there definitely helps to sell that premise because one thing that the strangers really does have working for it is that we can all probably put ourselves in our shoes you know if we're in that right age group all of us have been alone at one point in time maybe at a house that doesn't really have much nearby it there um and things seem a little bit creepy we've all been in that situation there before and i think having making sure the audience could have Liv tyler's eyes to look through as opposed to scott speedman's make it way more accessible because you know scott speedman definitely seems a little bit more capable in this film like Liv tyler is presented to us as the realist as things start happening she is obviously very uh she's already scared her tension is rising as it is she's the one that's really worried about everything that's going on to where scott speedman's kind of like it's a joke this is nothing to worry about everything is still perfectly fine right now and even when shit starts happening at that point he's kind of like the, you know the big guy that's like look we're gonna get out of this there's no issue or anything when in reality we know that these two people are probably in a much worse situation than it seems um our killers show up randomly. One of our killers shows up asking if somebody else is home at their house. And the opening scene to where we're introduced to this first character is a really, really good one because oftentimes in like home invasion movies and even in like, you know, just slasher movies, because I think that's kind of where the strangers goes is that it's supposed to be a bit of a slasher film. Um, we don't really get to meet our characters beforehand. You know, a lot of like the old school, like late 70s, early 80, 80s ones, there were some to where we knew who the killer was right away. And that is what The Strangers does, is that it doesn't really leave a mystery. That's not what the movie is, it's the reveal of who these killers are because it's completely irrelevant to the story itself. It's just the fact that they're the ones that are on this kind of killing spree. But it does help to build the tension because we know something worse is about to happen when, um, when uh, uh, Baby Doll, I think it is, is the character's name there, um, shows up and basically asks, is Tara home? <sighs> Good Lord, y'all, I'm sorry. Uh, and it's Dollface, not Baby Doll. Uh, when Dollface shows up and asks where Tara is, you know, she's not in the mask yet. The light is the lighting is done in such a way where we can't really make out her face, just like little bits and pieces here. And it's supposed to be terrifying because we don't really know what this woman looks like, but we know obviously she's up to no good. And then as the visits increase until, you know, actual attacks start happening. And I think one of the things that set up this movie, at least for me, to not really have the impact it's supposed to is that it gives away one of its biggest scares in the poster itself. If you've seen the poster, which if you're looking at the uh, looking, if you're listening to this podcast, and look at your phone or computer or whatever that you're listening to it on, um, the photo in there does show the poster for the strangers in there. But for those of y'all who owned the film or went and saw the film or have seen it before, you've seen the poster. It's Liv Tyler in the living room of the house and uh, Man in the Mask is just in the background kind of hovering with the mask there. And... It would be a very striking visual if you didn't know it was coming, if you weren't expecting it. But the poster, I remember even leading up to the film, absolutely spoiled that moment. So when Man in Mask shows up, it's like, okay, it's not hokey, it's not cheesy or anything, but there's just literally no impact to it. It's not scary the way that it needs to be, and it really should be. The fact that somebody is able to get into your house and they're potentially looking to harm you, that should be a really, really scary thing. And... As we go throughout this film, it's interesting to see that, you know, we know this is happening, but 
a lot of the film is built at Liv Tyler's expense. While she's freaking out and they're being terrorized, you know, Scott's Beeman isn't necessarily on board yet. She clearly knows there are people out there hunting them. There are people out there who want to do something with not good intentions for them there. She still is the only one that's believing it. And then as the intensity of the happenings and everything increased, that, that's when he comes on board. And maybe that's when the stakes get raised a little bit because, you know, Liv Tyler is our audience's view for sure, but Scott Speedman kind of makes it real at that point because if he's worried about everything that's going on, then that means now they truly are in danger at that point. But the problem is that the scares are really, really few and far between. Like, I think the film really dances the line too much of this is something realistically that could happen, which it could be, you know, somebody randomly showing up at your house and, you know, taking you out, terrorizing you. Or re reminds a lot of like the old Charlie Manson family murders and everything. But it like it like toes the line of being real, but then also not being fake enough to where it unfortunately lands itself in a middle place to where neither side is entertaining. To me, I didn't find it as interesting as a home invasion thriller. And I also didn't find it, find it as interesting as a slasher. The home invasion part didn't seem, uh, didn't seem as, as much as it could be because I guess I want a little bit more in the way of stakes for our characters. Um, I don't feel throughout the film that our characters were actually placed in any like real danger if that actually makes sense. Like the idea here, it, like throughout the film is like, look, they're trying to kill them. So there isn't a case of, all right, we're going to like attack you and come back. Like the entire plan is they're there the entire time in this single night. So there isn't really a case of maiming. So we know um, most likely these characters, if they are going to die, aren't going to die until the end of the film. And that kind of takes away a lot of the stakes from it uh, because in a home invasion thriller, we know that's what we're going to, but there aren't any other scares because if you can't die, what's so scary about it at that point? And I think about uh, in comparison to a film like Don't Breathe, which is about, you know, it's a reverse home invasion. Our bad guy is the person whose house is being bra uh, broken into, but they still managed to make that tense and they managed to make that scary because the blind man was just this cruel, mean, and ultimately just really scary individual with how precise and brutal and just like, like he was a killer. He's a psychopath, basically. And these three characters, you know, Man in Mask, Dollface, and Pinup Girl, it's not that they're not efficient at what they're doing, but then we do find out that this was only the first time that they were doing it. This was their origin story. And for some reason, it just takes a lot of the wind out from the sails here of the ship. And it doesn't just, it doesn't correct itself. And I say that knowing there are some very good parts in here. You know, initially uh, when Scott Speedman leaves and Liv Tyler smoking the cigarette and um, Dollface knocks on the door again and she shudders, one of the best reactions, like natural reactions in film I've ever seen. Cause like, it's a real scare. Obviously they didn't tell her when they were filming, like when the knock was going to happen. And it's a loud knock and Liv Tyler reacts to it very, very uh, normally, which is pretty awesome. That's a great scene. Um, the ending, the ending will kind of turn your stomach a little bit as well too. Um, just because it's, it's very torture like as well too. It's a really, really well done scene. Um, and I wish that the rest of the film could have kind of met the met what was brought to us in that last scene but you know say lovey can't always get everything that you want the other problem though is that because it's not a big cast at all like again it's scott speedman it's Liv tyler and then glenn howerton pops up just for a little bit in the film um because there's not a big cast we also can't get a lot of victims and that kind of does take away from our villains because if they don't have more people to kill if they don't have more people to maim if they don't have more, more people to terrorize it doesn't give us a big reason to be afraid of them because at any point we're kind of led to believe that if our heroes had more people with them the scales would be tipped and these killers would be screwed which um with things like you know like scream or if we think of like friday the 13th or nightmare on elm street that's just not really the case same with halloween we know that no matter what as evidenced in last year's halloween kills you could have the entire town coming after your villain and it doesn't matter like it doesn't matter that villain is gonna get you and we just don't feel that way in the strangers i was let down by it honestly um re-watching it for the first time in over a decade didn't really help my opinion of it as well too like there's a great film in there and, uh, you know, maybe five more, five years later, I'll watch this again and finally change my tune on it because I know a lot of people do enjoy it. But I found it to be just severely lacking both in scares 
and just in uh, what I would want from a home invasion thriller as well, too. Film like The Collector is more so my speed now, which, you know, that's a very different extreme compared to where The Strangers is at over here. Um, and it stinks because uh, they did release a sequel that was written by uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Bertino, who did write and direct the first film. He did write the sequel, and uh, uh, from all, like, all uh, information out there, he wrote it not long after the first film because the first film was such a big hit. So clearly the DNA of this story was supposed to expand across this other film. And the second film is a lot better because the second film really does feel like more of a slasher. They get, they really get away from the home invasion element of it and they go more into the slasher territory and it just works out so much better for this series. So um, we get to talk about that here in just a few weeks, but I am very interested. Did any of y'all get a chance to go and see the strangers opening weekend? You know, what did you think of it? Have you watched it by yourself? And does it still scare you? Let me know in the comments. Give me your thoughts and opinions on it. But that's The Strangers. Now to switch gears to talk about a film that came out a year later, let's talk about Orphan. So the first thing to hit on this is that Orphan has such a great cast to it, honestly. Like this is a big cast of a lot of really good players. You have Vera Farmiga. You have Peter Sarsgaard. You have uh, Isabel Furman. You have CCH Pounder. Uh, this is a really, really good cast that they've assembled for a film like this. And the story here, like I mentioned earlier, is that a family who's trying to have another child, they end up uh, losing the kid. And basically, after that, they decide they're going to adopt a kid instead. And they end up with nine-year-old Russian girl, Esther, who's from a local orphanage. Now, uh, Esther gets to join their five-year-old daughter, Max, who is uh, hearing impaired, as well as their 12-year-old son, Daniel, who doesn't really like Esther that much. And we basically get to watch this family get used to bringing another kid into their dynamic and seeing how they're all going to kind of respond to that. Now, I will admit the first time that I saw this film, um, I uh, the, the premise of it itself uh, reminds you a lot of other films, kind of like The Good Son or The Bad Seed. You're basically taking a kid who has murderistic, psychopathic tendencies and how is this family going to deal with it? Chances are somebody in the family might die or get like seriously hurt. And then eventually, usually it's the mom that has to come around and save the day for everybody. And that's kind of the same story here we don't really break the mold too much there is a colossal twist regarding esther and the reason why she's psychotic and crazy there that i'm not going to spoil in this review but what i will say is that if you like films like the bad seed or the good son or things like that you're really going to enjoy this one or even you know pet cemetery um you're really going to enjoy this film and a lot of that rests on the fact that isabel Furman is fantastic in the role of Esther. You have to keep in mind that when she filmed this, she really was that age there. Uh, uh, like uh, Isabel Furman was like legitimately, uh, you know, nine or 10 years old when she was filming this. And like she has to imbue quite a lot to Esther's character because as we go throughout this film and we start learning more and more about who Esther really is and what Esther really knows and the kind of skills that she has, you start to understand that Esther's a lot smarter than she lets on. And that even these adults that, you know, she's contending with, that she's fighting, rebelling against, whatever you want to say there, that she might have the one up on them as well, too. And that's what makes it scary, because similar to The Strangers, we don't have a high body count in this film. To be quite honest, only two people die in this movie, uh, three people, like ultimately, but only two people really die in this film. So like The Strangers, it doesn't have a high body count and it relies a little bit more on the scares that happen through the film and just Esther and these incidents that she goes through herself. And Esther is brutal. And it does remind you of these other films about these childhood terrors because that's the way that Esther does it. Esther knows that she can't really go off killing a bunch of people or anything like that because that might raise a bit, uh, a bit too many suspicions. But she can severely hurt a lot of these people who are causing her a lot of problems. And she sure does. Esther throws caution to the wind a number of times throughout the film. And... It almost seems like a bit of a different movie about like an abusive sibling or an abusive family member there because as Esther's doing all these bad things, it's a whole case of her also intimidating her new step siblings basically and saying, look, don't tell anybody or I'll fucking murder you basically. And it works so well because like, again, it's a nine-year-old girl 
terrorizing her younger new sister and her older new brother and knowing that these kids have no power and they can't go to the parents because the parents aren't really believing it either because they've wanted so long to have another child so their eyes are blind for a lot of this and there's so many good fun elements to this film like for the fact that peter sarzegard is apparently the, just this big dilf in this film that all these women want and i love it because i love peter sarzegard i think he's a fantastic actor and it's just like you know what give him that role that's for him he does an excellent job with it i love it uh vera farmiga who is no stranger to horror films from the conjuring series from uh bates motel and a number of other things does a great job as the mother becoming unhinged as she realized something is wrong with her new daughter and even the siblings do a great job uh you know jimmy simpson is there as uh as as the son trying to convince uh trying to convince his family that something else is wrong with this new addition um and then ariana engineer plays max their younger daughter who unfortunately is left with the burden of carrying a lot of esther's problems that she's bringing on now uh it's not necessarily a gory film but what i will say is that the reveal at the end is fantastic i think it was a great twist and a great way to go and it does offer a really good reason for why we're going a prequel route instead of a sequel route because we find out that everything that's happening in this film has happened to other people before and we kind of have an idea of what that means happened to these other families especially probably the more most recent family before it got here to uh to our cast of characters in this film and it makes the idea of a prequel super exciting especially the fact that isabel Furman's going to play that role of esther again at her current age which is not nine or ten because we're talking you know 20 years later or not 20 years later but 12 13 years later so that's really interesting to see and hear about the upcoming prequel but i remember liking this movie a lot more than i expected to and i think you guys will too so you're definitely going to want to check that one out that's orphan for you and that's going to do it for us get to the facebook groups so you can find out more information about our watch party make sure to like comment to share and subscribe uh, I'm excited to see y'all back here next week. We're going to do some Valentine's Day fun with my bloody Valentine. But that's going to do it for me, y'all. My name is T. We've been talking scary movies. Stay scared.